first of all, Shana Tova to everyone. Um, Brian and I will uh, start by introducing ourselves and then identifying the question that we were hoping we could discuss today. Um, and we do hope it will be a discussion. So uh, feel free to jump in at any point in time that you feel so moved or at the end. Um, we'll definitely make sure we leave some time at the end. Uh, my name is John Greenblatt. Um, I am a WHC uh, member, um, was a board member for a period of time. Uh, pertinent to the thing we're gonna discuss, uh, discuss today, I, was, uh, I am a lawyer um, and I had been in uh, the law firm of Sherman and Sterling for uh, more than 40 years. Um, I started as a summer associate, then I was a su associate, then I was partner. Um, and uh, that will become relevant when we discuss the, the purpose of, um, of today's, uh, what we're gonna talk about today. I was the uh, voice of the University of Connecticut Huskies on the radio. Uh, that's probably my most uh, important role in life. Uh, I did basketball, football, and baseball. And if I had known there was gonna be an ESPN, uh, I would be talking about a different subject now, but I took a different path. And with um, uh, Brian Parker, who I'm gonna introduce in a moment, uh, we co-founded a company called Legal Innovators, uh, the, the relevance of which we'll discuss in, 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 once we talk about the topic. Um, but with no, without any further ado, I wanted to, uh, to allow Brian to introduce himself. He's my business partner in this, in this uh, venture. And um, after he does, uh, we'll pick up from there. Um, thanks, John. <clears throat> um, so nice to meet everybody. Um, wishing you all a, a blessed holy day. And uh, I appreciate you and John's family having me uh, at evening services for Yom Kippur last night. I uh, got a lot out of it and really appreciated being in community with you all. Um, as John said, I'm the co-founder uh, of Legal Innovators, I'm John's business partner. But uh, before that, this was a long time ago. And I thought John was going to say his most important role in life had been being my mentor 25 years ago, but he talked about UConn basketball. I guess that's okay. So maybe I'm number two. Um, John and I met when I was a summer associate at Sherman and Sterling, um, and he indeed was my mentor. And part of what we're going to talk about today is as we are, um, you know, in community with the world, what's our obligation, uh, you know, to others. So here was John, um, you know, who was a partner, obviously had a business interest in the firm, uh, but took me under his wing and, and we've kept in touch all these years. And I think it's uh, morphed into a, you know, a great friendship where we continue um, to try to do good things um, in, in in the world. And so I was at Sherman doing uh, m and A. I I did investment banking for about a decade. Uh, and then I've been on the operational side for about the last 15 years and a variety of, um, I've run a billion dollar division of a very big company. Um, and then uh, a couple of startups. I'm our, our, our CEO with John as our chairman. Um, and, you know, I think relevant maybe uh, to what we're talking about here uh, as well. I've been involved in, in politics and this social justice movement uh, even before I was born. Um, and I say that because uh, obviously you've got, uh, you know, African-American and a Jewish partner here talking about social justice. And I think it's, um, you know, really important to remind all of ourselves of the great partnership uh, that we had in the 60s. And I say before my time, because it was before my time, uh, my mom uh, was the first in her high school to integrate uh, this little school in uh, East uh, Rural, um, South Georgia. And when I looked and heard the stories, um, there were other white people that helped for sure and allies, but the majority of them uh, were Jewish. And so, you know, I grew up in the tradition that we had this uh, very good partnership um, that clearly helped uh, my community. Um, I later joined uh, APAC and I've been uh, part of the African-American uh, fellowship within, uh, within APAC because I, you know, believe in uh, both repaying past favors um, and and trying to pay it forward. So maybe we'll talk about that today. And for people that are listening, I mean, you know, this certainly is is not mandatory or anything. Um, but one of the things, and I'm going to get out of the way and turn it back to John, so we can kind of tee up the conversation. We'd love to have an interactive dialogue and questions and things like that. And so to that end, if you're comfortable, we would love to see everybody's faces on camera. Um, it just kind of helps have that community and the interaction. So uh, if you are comfortable, please do uh, turn your turn your cameras on and and just love being here. Uh, John, thank you for a couple minutes. Yeah, and Brian left out one uh, additional uh, fact about himself that's uh, relatively new, but also relevant, which is he oh, was yeah. now, uh, 
uh, seeking his master's degree in uh, the divinity program at Howard in his spare time while he's the CEO of this company we started. So, um, so uh, uh, we're both pretty faith, faith based. And yeah. with that background, uh, let me describe the question I think that we are hoping we can talk about today. Uh, which is, do we as Jews, and indeed as all ethical citizens, whether Jewish or not, in general, have a duty to utilize our skills, resources, wisdom, experience to address structural inequity and social injustice uh, in our professional and personal lives where we see it? And do we have to look for it, actually? Um, I think Interestingly, as we were thinking about the answer to that question, uh, I was reading last night during the Kol Nidre services uh, some of the passages, one of which directly addressed this, which said, uh, we dishonor you, we're speaking to God now, we dishonor you when we dishonor our society. For our failures of justice, Adonai, we seek your forgiveness. And one of those is, for permitting social inequities to prevail and for lacking uh, the vision to transcend our selfishness. And it really struck a chord with me given what we were gonna talk about today because it used the word for permitting social inequities to prevail. Um, it did not say for personally engaging in acts of social inequity. And so um, with that backdrop, which is essentially one calling for you, for all of us, to engage in action to, to prevent social in, inequity from prevailing. Um, we can't just justify our own behavior by saying we're not personally racist, or we're not personally doing all we can do. Um, we also need to be uh, seeking to be more proactive to that. And um, I'm just going to set this up with one slide. I'm not a big fan of slides, as Brian knows, because they can get distracting. But just so we can stay on track, um, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up with, with one slide that will um, keep us a little bit uh, uh, organized, I hope. Um, and can you all see that? Can people see this slide? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, so structural injustice requires structural solutions is really the topic that we want to talk about. Um, the agenda is what I just said. What's our ethical duty to use our specific knowledge, skills, um, resources, wealth, whatever we bring to the table to address structural inequity and social injustice where we see it in our professional and personal lives. We're going to just use uh, the company we formed, Legal Innovators, solely as a case study. We don't want to dwell on it. It's really to engage in a discussion of what you may see in your own lives and in your own professions and, and in your personal interactions with people. So we're hoping the discussion transcends this case study um, and goes further into, um, you know, what it is we want to talk about today. Um, I got to figure out how to not screen share now. Um, um, but I will figure it out. You, did, um, you just there's a button at the top, John, that should say "Stop Screen Share." It's a red button at the top of the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, it's actually in the bottom of mine. But okay, oh, okay, thanks. okay, yep. Um, uh, so Leslie, no problem. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to see you've got a Yukon connection right now. Um, um, so when Rabbi Lustig asked us to present on this, he he put it in the context of Leviticus 19, the so-called um, Jewish ethical code. Um, and there are some parts of that ethical code we probably all would agree we don't ascribe to today. They're, they're out of date and they uh, are actually in today's context would be not so ethical. But there's a lot of things in that code that resonate today. Um, um, one of them is love your neighbor as yourself, commanding us in fact specifically to leave some of our harvest for the poor, which means a, a lot when you think about that concept. When a stranger sojourns with us in our land, we shall do him no wrong. We shall treat him as native, it says, which is obviously pertinent to much of what we discussed today about immigration and the way to embrace people who are coming to our country um, or have come to our country and have lived here for a long time and, and contributed to it. We're forbidden to curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. In other words, we are 
commanded to have empathy um, and to uh, reach out and use our resources to help people. Um, and in other places, the, the Bible forbids the sin of omission, which is very much like that first passage, passage I read, which says, um, we seek for, for forgiveness for permitting social inequity, permitting it. So it, it's essentially requiring us to be proactive in when we see social inequities and social injustices to use, to, 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 to jump in and to be, to actually address them in our personal lives. Brian, um, I don't know whether you want to comment a little more about any of the biblical references, um, but after you do, I'll jump in and describe this one context that we're addressing and then take it from there. Yeah, you know, John, I, I think you set it up well. I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, super briefly, right, because we, we talked uh, last night and I know, you know, uh, you know frequently uh, folks talk about the story of uh, Exodus. And I think we can read Exodus and Leviticus together. And I think that the message there um, is a sort of liberation theology, right? And there are some debate amongst uh, um, Old Testament scholars can you, can you expand the liberation message uh, from Exodus uh, beyond the Jewish community uh, into, into others, right? So whether we're talking about Blacks or Rwanda or uh, immigration or any of the other uh, topics that you, that you mentioned. So I might just have us um, consider um, this idea of uh, liberation going with your idea of what is what is our role, right? Not only doing this 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 holy season, but going forward, um, in that we've been liberated by by the blessings that we're all here. How do we extend those to others that may need our help in in, in whatever way? Um, and I, you know, look, we're 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 not here to preach or teach, so I'll, I'll just leave that as um a, as a question. And I think that. Um, both in the uh, business that you're going to describe, John, um, in our inclusivity, and in the pro bono work, as we, as all lawyers do, um, providing um, you know justice and access to uh, to law, um, are some things that we can think about in the context of these texts. So we're going to talk just for a second about um, the company we form, not because we're trying to focus on the company, but because of the problem we saw and the solution we thought we might be able to bring to it at this stage of our lives. Um, and, um, and, and as I say, I hope we'll blow it out into what you confront. But um, if this provides context, it'll be uh, to answer the question, which is what can we do to use our skills, resources, wisdom, um, um, wealth to address structural inequity I came from a big law pra uh, form of practice. You know, one, in fact, when Sherman is, when I joined Sherman and Sterling, it was then the biggest firm in uh, the United States, other than Baker and McKenzie. It was the biggest firm in New York, um, which uh, it is no longer because there are firms with thousands of people in them. But, um, but a big law, uh, where I would submit that most of the lawyers I know and the partners in big law actually have some of the best intentions and hold themselves to extremely high ethical and moral um, uh, requirements and understanding of um, problem solving is probably as its highest. I would say that what really occurred to me in the 40 years I was practicing there was the profession's aversion to risk. Um, has utterly paralyzed it from making anything approaching adequate inroads in true racial and to, uh, even today in gender diversification, particularly at the highest levels, meaning at the partnership levels of the firms. The numbers are abysmal. They've been abysmal since I was a summer associate. Um, they have really not changed. Uh, the profession hasn't been particularly creative in addressing these things. And over the course of 40 years at the firm, I was uh, increasingly frustrated. I had co-founded the firms, and this isn't about that firm, by the way. That firm did lots of creative things to try to address things um, that many people in the profession did not do. I'm talking about the profession generally. But the profession of the law, embarrassingly, I would say, given our ethical standards, has been pitiful in seeing advancements and diversity in the highest ranks of the profession. And uh, when, when I co-formed the, uh, the diversity committee at the firm in the 90s, 
we used to sit around the table and talk about how can we recruit, retain, and promote to partner more uh, persons of color, lawyers of color. And I went to a, a, I was kind of an emeritus member uh, almost 30 years later, really, of the same committee. And we were having precisely the same discussion as is the profession at large with uh, calls to action uh, being generated by things like George Floyd's murder, but, the, but we are not making progress in solving the problem. Um, and I was really in fresh, frustrated that so many uh, intelligent, I think well-intentioned people haven't been able to move the needle. So when I was contemplating what to do with the next 40 years of my life um, after uh, being in law firm for 40 years, Brian and I connected again because we really do have this uh, strong bond and spiritual connection as well. And we decided to try to tackle some of these issues from the outside um, but with inside knowledge, with the insight provided from having been on the inside and see if we couldn't more creatively solve the problems than the law firms were able to do on their own. Um, Ryan, do you want to jump in with anything before um, we go through uh, what the problem was and then some of the solutions? And, and we'll stop then so we can open it up to discussion after that. Yeah, I, I think uh, two, two things really, um, and, and I'll make those quick. Um, one is uh, we, we've written a, a white paper, anybody that, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can download it and read it, uh, but it's called Restoring Lost Hope. So we talk about systemic approaches to, to, to trying to uh, confront the problems that John has been talking about. This really came out, and we have one of the deans of the leading law schools in the country on here with us, uh, Dana Matthew. Um, she can be much more articulate than, than I, but, but really it's a foundation piece, which is, and you can mark these with any demographic, right? But I looked at from the time I was an associate 25 years ago, the number of black associates in big law was 5%. 25 years later, it was 5%. So when we talk about this idea of liberation, we can see that it's it's more than access. It's inclusivity. It's places of belonging, those kind of things. Um, the the other piece that that I'll make is uh, for for non lawyers, right? And if you're or or if you're a lawyer and you're thinking outside of the business context, as John and I do, in fulfilling our our pro bono uh, responsibilities, I was on a podcast uh, yesterday, and they asked me at the end, what do you what would you like to see as the future of of the legal justice system. And I said, oh, justice system. Okay, so we're moving away from just business. And I said, um, a system where the rule of law works for all of us, um, a system where um, these voting uh, regulations aren't being done to suppress people, but to uplift people, um, and a system where um, uh, you don't have Texas's of the world telling women what they can do with their bodies. So I think we have a number of things that whether we wanna look at this from a business perspective or we wanna use our talents and uh, treasures uh, to help out in the social context. So um, I just offer those two points, John. Thanks, Brian. So, um, so we, we step back and say, what, what is the problem here? Why is it that we are not making more progress? I mean, the percentage, what did Brian used is 5%. I think it's 2% for black partners in law firms, yeah, in, right. in major law firms across the country. Worse for small law firms, by the way, um, uh, unless they're black owned law firms. Um, yeah. so why and, and, that's, and, and by the way, Latinx, disabled community, LGBTQ. So I don't want to say that this is just a black problem. There are a number uh, of folks across the board that are affected. Um, sorry, John. So, so we said, well, one thing is the entry level pipeline into big law is simply too narrow. Um, yeah. And that comes from an archaic, in today's day, an archaic and extremely elitist method of recruiting that big law engages in, which is a function of the risk aversion that big law firms have to making any kind of change from the way things have been, do, been done for literally decades. You know, they focus on a handful of law schools, they look at one year of grades, um, they never come back, and then they, you hire someone into the summer program after the, to start after their second year of law school, and then they get an offer to come back. That's the track in. There's no other way for a young lawyer to get in, actually, once that track is foreclosed to them. And that includes a lot of people in both good and, uh, well, in all law schools, and I'm saying high, I shouldn't say good, they're all good, in highly ranked and 
um, not as highly ranked law schools. They just don't get looked at. Mm -hmm. And we know intuitively and actually empirically that there's a lot of really, really good lawyers who don't get into that track. Um, so that is one problem. The second problem is we've managed to get to a price point that is so irrational that it leads firms to be even more risk averse um, because they're making such an expensive bet on a person at the junior levels of their career that they won't take any risk on anyone. Um, the retention rate after that entry level pipeline being too small is horrible. The retention rate for young lawyers and law firms is um, always been a problem. And, and usually it was at the law firms, uh, the, it was the law firm that decided whether somebody was gonna be retained. That's completely flipped around now um, where the lawyers are deciding they don't wanna be retained, meaning they don't wanna stay. Um, but it's disproportionately large for, uh, for uh, attorneys of color and other underrepresented uh, aspects of the population. Um, there, that is a function of a lack of true inclusion in the law firms. If you talk to um, persons of color who've been in law firms, they do not feel included and they don't see people like them in the partnership ranks, which leads to a vicious cycle because the tiny, tiny number of associates that make partner leads the people who are behind them to see no one who looks like them and then they leave. So it is totally a vicious cycle and the profession has been unable to break out of this mold and address it from within. So with that in mind, Brian, maybe you wanna just describe a little bit just at a high level, our approach to trying to solve that problem. So we can then move past this model and talk about models that may appeal to you in your profession or in your personal. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, look, the, the, probably the way that maybe we would, we would suggest to think about it is from the data and, and what's happening. Right. And so when we're, we try to be very data driven. And I think if we are, um, isolate the issues, uh, and figure out what are the root causes, and then we can map solutions onto, onto those things, right? I think with that kind of construct, uh, whatever your business is, then maybe there'll be some lessons to, or, or, or your social mission, maybe there'll be some lessons to, to take from that. So um, with, with what John was talking about, um, you see that there are a number of factors in, at, at play, and we try to be very intentional and say, look, um, there are uh, headhunters out there. There are contract people that can come with, with uh, lower solutions. There's uh, diversity consultants. There's um, all these bit uh, components. But is there one system that can tie all of these things together? And I think the way we try to look at ourselves and look at the issue is go back to the data, the 5%, Latinx, 2%. Uh, LGBTQ, um, you know, seven and a half, seven point eight percent, and disabled communities, you know, sort of one point two, right? So there, the, we we can look at all those things and say, okay, well, the the solution then needs to be from identifying people from a broader base. Um, and, you know, GW, I've got uh, two colleagues here on the phone, John is an alumni, and again, Dean Matthew. Um, and that's great, right, to have uh, us go to top 25 schools. And I went to NYU, and I had some wonderful opportunities. And um, we have Georgetown as a partner. But we also have Howard, and we have UConn, and we have Maryland, and we have Hastings, and we have a number of other strong regional schools. And I think if you think about most lawyers that you know, there were some pretty good ones that come outside of the top 25. So um, we can get more inclusive around some of the demographics that I talked about by looking further. I think then um, we, we, we still say in our business that it's a quality game. Well, uh, we reject the notion that you can't be inclusive and maintain quality, but how do you prove that from a data perspective? And again, where we brought John's and my skill sets together, John's been writing for 40 years as a litigator, we develop a writing prompt. So if I can take people from the number 75 school, the number 25 and the number five school, read their writing samples next to each other and, and, and satisfy ourselves that they can do the same work Okay, well, I've got I've got another uh, factor that tells me I can be inclusive and maintain quality. We also have something that we call Moneyball for Lawyers, and that is a algorithm that we look at 
that takes about 20 different factors in looking at uh, a person's entire history. So their college and their law school and did they work and first generation, a number of other things that produces a score. Again, take the same example of those, those law schools that I said. And, and what we see is in the, in the data, the predictive analytics, that there are lawyers from all over that can compete. And what we're now seeing as we get, as we've gotten into the work is that across the board, all of those people can compete as well. Super quick example, Latham is hired out of our program, now 5% or, or five people, they've loaded up with double. And I can tell you from across that, you've got Howard, you've got a UConn person, uh, you've got an NYU person, you've got a GW person, and I'm sure I'm forgetting, oh, and a Georgetown person, right? So we can see we were more inclusive, we maintained the quality, uh, and I think that we did something for the profession. Super quick, because we do want to save time for questions. Training and mentoring are just fundamental to what we're doing. I think you can see not just the friendship that's come out of uh, John uh, and I mentor and the mentoring he's done and the, um, my uh, learning about mentoring and what I've been able to do with that um, is, is a gift that we can give to uh, a, a new generation uh, of, of folks that also combined with measuring the opportunities that are given, with, uh, given to people gives a sense that you belong, you can be trained, you can succeed. If you can do all those things, then as you put people into the front side of the system, we still have to worry about retention. Those are all things that help us ensure that people will stay, uh, will stay in. Um, we reduce, I, we can talk about this another time or with questions, um, but we right-size the cost. We also say to people, um, we'll prove it and pay us on the back end. I mean, you're paying for the services as you go, but we have success fees on the back end and we de-risk the hiring process. Cause we say, look, like the European training model, you can look at our folks for up to two years, then make a hiring decision. That's much better way. And we're confident of the product that we're putting out there and how people are gonna perform throughout all of this. And, and I wanna underscore, we have diverse and non-diverse lawyers, but our mission, part, a big part of our mission is to disproportionately impact um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the profession of, of the law. Again, it all goes back to the data. So if I look at that 5%, if I look at the 2%, if I look at the 7%, what is going to be true in five years? What is going to be true in 10 years? If we can do that, and I don't know that John has another 40 years of working, but whatever time uh, he does decide to stop working, then he can say, okay, um, I've uh, run another business but have done some legacy work and tying this back to the idea of liberation and those, those, um, the, the stuff out of the text, out of Exodus and out of uh, Leviticus, this is, this is kind of what we're talking about. And just to give some examples, I think I'm going to stop there because we, we can get into uh, the weeds much, much more, but I know that we only have 12 minutes. So John, yeah. I'll just flip it back to you. Well, I just want to add, just so everyone understands the context, because, because this is relevant to, uh, extrapolating from this by being on the inside both of us understood the degree to which quality is critical and you're not going to get law firms to make a difference if they think they're sacrificing that so we have to prove that and as brian said what we're what we did to make it this is where we bring some creativity is we hire the people we train the people we vet them we vouch for them and then we place them, as Brian said, with big law firms, big prestigious law firms, and then they get hired away from us. And this, this is where we can add some creativity coming from the inside that allows um, to make a change because they wouldn't look at them otherwise. Um, and so, um, so the question now for everyone is, in your lives, whatever you're seeing, either personally or professionally, what structural inequities have you seen? And are there you know, creative things that you can bring to bear by having experience and having access that uh, might address a problem you're familiar with. Or if you want to talk about this one more, we can talk about this, this particular professional model, but this is just one model. Yeah, uh, Dean Matthew, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Uh, mute. Uh I have my hand up, but I don't know how to do the electronic hand. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say um, that I think the uh, solution that legal innovators, Brian, you and, and, and John have come up with is bigger 
uh, and I want to emphasize the word systemic, then you've given it credit for. Uh, because I actually think that you are solving an access to justice problem. There's a lot of data that says when you educate uh, lawyers from underrepresented and marginalized groups, be they Black, Latinx, Native, from the disabled people's community, LGBTQ, those people have a disproportionate likelihood of going back to those communities and representing them and increasing the access to justice for otherwise marginalized communities. So by allowing access to marginalized groups, to the training, the networks, the power, frankly, that comes from and comes with big law, I think you're aiming at a bigger problem. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm just going to say that you did it uh, by doing what I think any of us in this room could do, which is crossing the systemic divides. I look at you, you're a black guy and a white guy, right? So you cross the divides. Mm -hmm. You're a Christian and a Jew, and you cross the divides. And you are from communities of faith, which I think are the ones with the moral mandate yeah. to do justice, right? Uh, and I'm just going to go with the Old Testament because that's a book we all share, right? That's when I look at true. Nehemiah, which is the book I'm in right now, everybody built a little piece of the gate. So whatever big problem we see that's too big for any of us, just build the gate that's right in front of your wall. Right. Just the wall that's broken right in front of you. And in 52 days, you might save Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. um, that's my two cents. And I admire you guys immensely. Well, we really appreciate what you had to say. Yeah. That really does help put it in a larger yeah, context yeah, so articulately. Yeah. Um, so incredibly grateful. And what a, I, there are two GW law grads here. Absolutely. So. We, we are a big recruiter at GW So um, and, and at many law schools. Uh, we now recruit at 31 law schools, actually. Um, and the model's definitely starting to work as big law firms are beginning to try us. Um, but again, it's not so much about that. It's, it's about seeing something that is bugging you that you think is unfair and figuring out a way to address it. Because we can write checks, which I don't want to minimize. Those checks are really important. But can you use your skills and experience um, and network and power, as Dean Matthew said, um, to do more than that? Uh, Janice? Uh, I'll just give you a quick personal story. Uh, I was in the first graduating class of Cardozo School of Law, part of oh, Yeshiva wow. University. And yes. in the first year, I got friendly. Can you hear this okay? Yes, we sure uh, Friendly with the only Black student in the class mm. of 400 some people. And um, Eventually, she wanted to start a Black Student uh, Balsa, Black Student Law Association, mm -hmm. and asked me if I would join because there was no one else she was she was particularly friendly enough with to feel comfortable to do that. And I felt perfectly comfortable until she asked me if I wanted to be president, and I said, "I don't think that's appropriate." When there is a black person in the class, you. So long story short, we maintained a friendship. And to this day, I'm still invited back to Balsa um, events. And had I gone on to work at a law firm um, rather than what I did, our friend, having built this friendship, this connection, either I didn't go where she went and she didn't go where I went, but if either of us had brought, I mean, Jewish, you don't hear about how Jews were turned around, turned back uh, from law schools yeah. uh, back in the day. And, and law firms too. And law That's firms, right. certainly. Right. <clears throat> and so I think having friendships, just um, encouraging, I don't know how you encourage it other than life experiences, but I think that's a very subtle and yet effective, that's not why I became friendly with her or she with me, not to help each other out, but 
it, it would lead to that probably very naturally and comfortably. Yeah. So that's great. Thanks, Janice. So then I, sure. I totally agree with what you said. That's a great point. Great point. Others but I have, think what you guys are doing is, is just wonderful. It's very, I had never heard of this. Yeah, it, we're new. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. you will hear of us at some point. But, uh, well, good new. luck. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Janice. Blame, blame, blame the marketing people if it doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looked like there was a hand Mark up. Mark yeah. had his hand up. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Hi, guys. Uh, uh, I'm Mark Bale, and I... I'm actually a, uh, an NYU grad. And ah, I think, Brian, okay. you actually look familiar. We might have overlapped. I graduated in 97. Um, oh, yeah, 95. Okay, so yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe we did. But, uh, <laughs> and, I'm a, I'm a, and I'm at a what you would probably consider to be a, a big law firm. Um, okay. And I've... Uh, and I find, you know, your, your information, especially your data to be very, very interesting. Um, and I think I've experienced it myself um, mm -hmm. over the last, I've been at the same firm for the last 20, almost 24 years now. Wow. And <laughs> we have, and I've been involved in the recruiting. I've gone to NYU on campus recruiting and, uh, and I always try to make an effort to um, make sure that uh, our recruiting class is as diverse as possible. And we've recruited, I think, successfully over the years, uh, dozens of uh, black, African American, and other people of color, uh, minorities, um, but without fail, not not once, not not a single one of them is is a partner in our firm right now, and I, you know, and that's always bothered me too. And I think you, the idea that you're focusing on this is is great, but one of the things, and you know, there's been a few who who've left after a couple of years, but then there's been a few who've who've stuck it out for five, six, seven years, and they're on the verge of being, they're in the partnership track. And then, you know, at the last moment, almost they leave. And, and I've talked to several of them and I ask, you know, why are you going? You know, you're, you're going to be made partner. I, they haven't told you yet, but I'm telling you, stay, you'll be made partner. And uh, invariably the reasons, and they might not be telling me, they don't want to maybe say this, I think, because I think some of your points about not having the role models in the partnership can contribute to that. They don't, but they don't say that. Um, they'd say that, um, that they have all these other opportunities that they were offered. Um, unique opportunities, neat uh, companies, clients from our, our firm who, who coach some of our attorneys. Um, so they've got these opportunities. And I think the law firm life um, has changed a lot. And I think while law firms are being a lot more aggressive in recruiting and trying to retain uh, minorities than they once were, certainly probably when I started in the 90s and even in the 80s and the 70s, I think, you know, we didn't even have a black attorney at our firm, I don't think until sometime in the 70s, and my firm's over 100 years old. And I think the the, the issue, though, is that um, the, the law firm life has changed in the last 20 years that I've been there, um, where part, and especially for partners, where it used to be when I started my managing partner, the senior partners in my firm, they play golf on Friday afternoons. Uh, he, you know, when our, our managing partner never missed a home football game of his son's football team in high school, and he was always at the games. Um, it, it's much harder to do that now. The expectations for, for partners, for senior attorneys and firms, uh, the billable hour expectations, the actual amount of time that you spend you know, that, that gets billed to clients is now in a range where um, it's very hard to have, um, you know, balance in life. And I think some of uh, the minority um, candidates, minority uh, attorneys um, see that and they see other opportunities. So I guess my question to you all is, um, you know, have you seen that in some of the data? Have you seen when you've, you've spoken to some of the, the attorneys and say, look, you know, is this really because you don't see the role models in the firm? They, the firm doesn't have the senior uh, people of color, or is it that there are these other opportunities and perhaps even better lifestyles for them? So you've touched on so many different important points, Mark, um, all of which we hear, see, agree with. Um, there's an, a potential existential crisis for law firms generally, which has which cuts across race. Which is is this an attractive? lifestyle for this generation of young lawyers coming up who have a different sense of work-life balance and um, they are prepared to sacrifice some money for other things. Um, that's number one. So that cuts across everybody, right? But when you have a teeny pool of people to start with, it's going to have a disproportionate impact on that pool, 
right? Because if, if we're already making it an unattractive lifestyle for people, uh, and then you only have three black associates in your firm and you're putting all your hopes in one to make yeah. it, you know, it, you can't make progress. Um, so then the second thing is, I think added to that, and this touches on a comment Leslie made in the chat, added to that is the additional stress that uh, attorneys from underrepresented aspects of the portion, portions of society already feel, which is they feel sometimes uh, an imposter syndrome, which is, do I belong here? You know, am I only as good as my first mistake? Which is what some some people actually that is the way law firms sometimes look at things. Um, th there isn't someone who looks. There's no one who can mentor me above and tell me what went through it. And why is it that all these other things are more attractive options for them? So when they get to their sixth seventh year, why is it that in house is more attractive? What what are we doing wrong as law firms that we can't keep somebody like that to feel vested in the partnership? That goes to a whole different problem, which legal innovators won't solve. But, you know, if we all have to be in the certain ranking in, legal, in, in, in um, the American lawyer, and we are chasing that and defining ourselves that way, we are going to not appeal to a lot of people. And it's narrowing the, it's narrowing the uh, pool of people who actually are interested in us. We're, we're actually killing ourselves in the process of chasing that. Um, and I've seen it over the course of my career. All the things yeah. you said, I watched and lived and being a partner in a law firm is not a very a fun way to live a life right now. And we all have to examine that. And that will have an impact on the minority pool to a disproportionate effect, I think. Um, Brian, yeah, you I, jump in. yeah, no, I think it's, I, I think I agree with what both of you are saying and how the question is being phrased, right? And I do think that there's some allyship here. There is a uh, law of numbers, but John is going through, regardless of who you are, right? White, green, blue, purple, man, woman, whatever your origin is, um, your identity is, people aren't going to make partner, right? And so you've got to um, increase the, 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 the pipeline. And then the comments that I was touching on before, how do you retain people? How do you um, say that we have environments of true belonging where everybody can be their authentic selves? This is where the concepts of equity and inclusivity come in, right? Because the, notice that we're not talking about equality. We're talking about equity. So if you've earned your way in, we're saying, let's start from the same starting line and give everybody the same chance. So Mark, your, your comments are really well taken. What can we do with the data? Well, like you said, in, in I think historically, um, people gravitate to people that look like them, go to the same schools, go to the same country clubs. So if you're not in those spaces, are you being invited into the club? Are you getting the best work? So when you're up for partner, you're being evaluated against people maybe that have more experience. Um, the mentorship point, like with John, right? So we talk about mentorship leading to sponsorship. So who's talking about Brian Parker when I'm not in the rooms where the decisions are being made? So sponsorship leads to opportunity. And, and you know, John is a 40 year partner, though I've run some very big businesses, well back startups. Yes, we co-founded this, he's our chairman. And I think we collectively with investors made the, made the decision, hey, Brian will run the company as day-to-day -day CEO. But think about the implicit backing of that, of saying, well, wait a minute, you've got a 40 year or three year Sherman and Sterling partner, these investors, and they're saying, that this black guy, though I have a lot of credentials, should be your CEO. That gives you a bunch of credibility as you walk in the door. I can walk into any law firm, any corporation in America with authority and with some stuff behind me. And so I think it's some of those structural things that we have to think about doing that we're not maybe as cognizant of. And, and I know a topic for another day, I think, you know, if there are a question or two left, um, let's have them. But I think the work that we're starting here, and John and I say this all the time, right? Because you might imagine we're both alpha people with our with our strong opinions. We don't always agree. But what we do is say, there's love, there's respect. And we can speak truth to power to each other. When we walk out of that room, we still respect each other, even if we've disagreed. So um, if you're creating allies, 
you have to allow people to walk in the space, voice their opinions, learn without necessarily being shouted down like, oh, you're doing this and you're being bad, right? So we're all having a conversation, then we build the system together. And, and Mark, you know, we, we have aspirations to address other, because you're right, it's not just the pipeline problem, right? We can't solve it just by getting more people in the door. That's a start. The more, the more people there are, the greater, I mean, it's just a matter of math, the, the, the greater percentage right. uh, or chances you have of success. So that's a problem. But we need to work on the retention side. We need to mm -hmm. figure out, and, I, and I've talked to, I'm the ombuds person at my old law firm for diversity, which they wanted someone independent who understood the firm to be a, 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 an ear and an advocate for on diversity issues with to the diverse population in the firm. And I, I talked to a young woman and said, why is it that you know, people leave law firms at the third, fourth year? She said, well, we don't feel invested in. Well, you know, we really don't. I mean, if I, it would take someone convincing us that they're truly invested in our success. You know, they want to see us succeed, not for the numbers, not because clients are saying, but because they want us to succeed. And, you know, I don't think that message is being conveyed across the board in our profession adequately. Um, so, you know, it's a, not an easy problem. We've got all sorts of ideas of uh, trying to get more people into law school which we're not even talking about today because then the pool will be greater succeeding in law school. Then the pool will be greater of people who law firms will look at and addressing maybe even creating an off and on ramp for people where they can get out for a little while and come back in um, because uh, that may be a way to increase the um, representation at the partnership levels. But, you know, we're dealing with it at a time when Law firm partnerships are making a lot of money and law firm partners are miserable, which is a really strange dynamic to be dealing with, but it, but it is a fact. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or observations? We'd... And Leslie, I hope we got yours because totally agree with you that um, there, is not, um, there is not an appreciation of the additional stresses and sometimes it feels, I think, to uh, associates and black associates or associates in marginalized aspects of the portion, portions of the population feel they're, they're being essentially blamed as the problem. Let's fix you instead of fix us. And that is not gonna work. Yeah, so I, I, but I think it's a little bit more than that. And I try to go into the chat. I think it's not just blaming, but I think um, I thought Leslie's point and certainly as, as a black associate, I, I've, I've know people have felt like you've got to take on the burden of trying to fix all of the issues too. Um, and so I think it's a duality there, but Linda, go, you, you guys go ahead rather than. Uh, Somebody was asking, I'm not sure who. Yeah, yeah. Linda. It, it's actually yeah. Mark. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> it says Linda. My computer. <laughs> we, we make no assumptions here at Little Innovator. Yeah, right. Oh, Thank you, right. John. Right. No, I, I, I was just curious if, if I, 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 I'm partner in, in a law firm for many, many years, started started in 1980, and I've seen and experienced all, 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 <laughs> all the same things that, 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 that folks have talked about. Do, do you see anything on, on, on the client side? One thing I've noticed in the last 10 years is the two big cases I work on, the both 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 of my clients are now women. That never would have happened in, 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 uh, in 1980. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, I, I had my first African American female general counsel, which, which mm. again, never would have happened in 1980 when I started. Do you mm -hmm. see that sh showing up in the in, in the data in terms of are there greater opportunities for minorities in house? Is there something that law, law firms can do to emulate that, if that's true, or or is that coming from somewhere else in your experience? Just curious. Yeah, you John, want to start you want... Right or... Oh, sure. It, 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 you know what? I'll, I'll go quick. Look, yes, um, Mark, I do think that there are getting to be more opportunities. Um, and I think as we look at this and we reflect back to, you know, maybe a year and some four months um, on the other side of George Floyd, uh, the, the commitment that corporations uh, were making and are making uh, and law firms are, are making, right? It's we're investing in um, 
um, minority owned businesses, female, uh, women owned businesses, um, people, uh, businesses led by, by, by both of those as well. So I do think that you're seeing more of those opportunities on the corporate side. Um, just having served there for, for a while, it's a little bit more intentional, right? It's, um, there are a number of, of positions that you can go to in that sort of thing. But I do think law firms, um, are trying to, trying to think about, what are the ways, and this goes into the last question I think that we were having with, with, with Mark, of saying, how do we promote? How do we give you the sense that you can be here and compete in, in advance? And while we, we still have some more way to go, um, it's, it's, it's happening. I think this will be the only shameless uh, plug that, I, that I'll say about legal innovators, but it's certainly true for any um, uh, alternative legal service provider, right? there's a curated conversation that we can have that ties your question and Mark's question together. And that is, um, it's kind of like a, um, a false uh, dual choice that you stay at the law firm or you go to the corporation. There can be back and forth, but there can also be as a company like ours or others that are doing the same work. Well, let's have the curated conversation. Let's make sure, for instance, maybe you're doing six months or a year over at the corporation, you're getting that experience. And then the corporate leaders and the firm leaders are talking together and say, well, you know what? You may be better on the general counsel side. Or you may be better on the firm side. I think what firms start to really resent is they train the talent and then the corporation comes and grabs them away. And then, you know, to add insult to injury, they'll say, oh, guess what? Your diversity scorecard is down this, this, this year or this quarter. Well, that's just because you took, you know, one of our senior people. But if you're having a conversation, we can say, well, maybe I'm going to pro forma this, meaning that, yes, you took one of our people, but you'll get, we'll still give you credit for the scorecard purposes like you were still there. I think that there has to be much more talking and much more understanding and much more intentionality uh, between both so that you can say not only create more opportunities, but what are the right opportunities and the right paths? We used to say at DeVita right person, right role, right attitude, right job, right? And so I think that's how I think about it. But I know John had a, a couple of thoughts. As well, well, I was just going to say, Mark, to solve the problem, I think um, it's going to require law firms, clients, and law schools um, to truly work co collaboratively on this. Um, if you were to hear other comments from Dean Matthew, she would, she would say, as she did on a podcast that we sponsored with uh, four Black deans, that you know, we, we educate them, but you need to then place them. You need to accept them. You need to, you need to advance them. Um, and we need to work more, um, she said, we, the law schools need to work more collaboratively with the employers on the pro progress of someone's career and what is it that you want to see to make them successful. Um, but I think it's the clients too, and that tension needs to be dissipated because, um, you know, and clients, I mean, what we place people, by the way, in corporate legal departments, as well as with law firms, because we're, we're interested in launching them on a successful career, whichever career path that is. Right. Um, and, um, you know, they, they have their own, they start blaming the law firms, but then they have their own rigidity that doesn't, they're not willing to move. You know, we don't have, we don't take first years. Uh, you know, or we don't typically take, I was talking to the head of litigation at a, at a big company and I said, you got to drop the word we don't typically, because if you use that, the phrase, we don't typically, we're never going to, we're never going to make progress. We, we, we don't typically hasn't gotten it done. So we need to figure out what can you do? You, are you telling me that you can lean on your law firms to solve this problem, but you can't create one FTE? full-time equivalent position for a junior lawyer in your department and find someone to mentor them? You know, how deep is your commitment to this if you can't do that? So it's not going to get solved just by the law firms. I happen to come from that environment and, you know, see the, the issues there, but it's broader than that. And it's got to, I think we've got to engage in the conversation across the board. I oh, we're getting the rap signal. I don't know. You're you're getting a rap signal. I'm ignoring. But um, no, no, no. Um, it was a it was a private message. I didn't want to interrupt your train of okay, thought there. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess we have to. <laughs> 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 but I figured as a former board member, people could find you and, you know, if yeah, there's, yeah, yeah we were going to put they're... our contact info, but, you know, um, uh, we didn't want this to be, you know, right. commercial. So um, right. anybody right. has questions, um, you know, we're, it's real easy. John 
at legal-innovators.com or Brian, John with no H or Brian at legalinnovators.com. That's the one nice thing about a startup. You don't have to worry about a lot of email addresses at the beginning. But we appreciate the uh, engaged discussion and hope you'll be able to Thank think you. about ways you can take this and, you know, and uh, use your own resources and skills and wisdom.